My name is Martin, but I'm also better known as the Big Friendly Giant. So you can find me just about everywhere online as BFG Martin. I'm the co-founder of Product Tank and Mind the Product, which together are the world's largest community for product people. We have meetups in over 200 cities around the world and annual conferences and events all over the world as well. I've been doing this for quite a while, so 25 years of kind of startups and scale-ups across Europe, the US, and the UK. I co-authored Product Leadership um, mainly so that I could go talk to over 500 product leaders from other amazing companies and learn how they do things. And today I advise uh, our 90 plus uh, startups in our portfolio on all things products. And the reason I bring that up is the number one question I get from almost everybody is how do we know if we're building the right thing? And this usually stems from a bunch of questions like what should we do? Why are we doing this? And how are we going to do this? And really it comes down to decisions. As startup founders, as product people, as product leaders, you're just making decision after decision after decision. And it can get really tiring after a while. So how do we decrease our decision overload while increasing decision velocity and quality? Well, that's why I developed what I call the decision stack. And it's here to really set meaningful constraints, but actually also to give you more freedom. The decision stack is made up of a series of decisions. You start with the vision, then your strategy, your objectives, your opportunities that stem from those objectives, and it's all underpinned by your principles. And I'll go through this in detail, but the really important thing to note here is that as you're making these decisions, you're also saying you're not going to do these things. And that's really, really important. Decisions actually come from the Latin desidera, which means to cut off. It's so freeing to make that decision and say, we're focused on this, not on that. So you never have to worry about that other thing again, and you can just get on with building what you want to do. And the beauty of the decision stack is it helps connect the dots from the top to the bottom by asking how. How are we going to achieve this vision? Well, here's the strategy. How are we going to achieve that? Well, here are the objectives. How are we going to achieve that? And so forth. But it's also amazing because as individual contributors, you can ask, why are we doing this? And hopefully it should ladder all the way back up to your vision uh, as a company. The problem is too many companies don't have all the pieces of the stack. And of course, if one of them's missing, then all the others are going to collapse on you. The other thing to note is that this is kind of an inception moment where you have decision stacks probably at every level of your organization. As a startup, you might just have one, uh, but as you start scaling up, each individual product will probably have its own decision stack that has to ladder up to a company decision stack. As you get into bigger and bigger organizations, you have more and more of these layers. So how do you actually go about building your decision stack? Well, as you saw, it all begins with your vision. It all begins with answering the question of why are we building this in the first place? And just walk through this, I'm gonna share a little bit of a personal story here, which is when we started Mind the Product, we kind of did one of these typical vision statements of we wanna be the leading product community in the world. But of course, that doesn't really say anything about who we're doing this for or why we're doing it or how we know if we're successful. And it's really just about comp competition. So in about 2018, we got the whole team together and we focused on how can we rewrite this to be a vision statement that other people understand and so our customers understand what it is that we're trying to do. And we came up with this to make product people more successful by coming together to further our craft. Now, the beauty of this vision is that it's incredibly flexible, and we'll see this uh, later on, but as you can imagine over the last year, running conferences has not been the most easy thing to do. But our vision doesn't mention conferences. It mentions bringing people together, and we've been able to do that online. We've been able to do that through other methods than conferences. Now, the reason this is so important is that vision is focus. 75% of venture-backed startups fail. And the number one reason cited in a study at the Harvard Business School was a lack of focus. And focus creates product depth, and depth always trumps width. But vision is also motivating. So when you start building your team, uh, it's important to figure out how are you going to motivate them. And Daniel Pink, in writing up a bunch of research that came out of MIT, said that motivating employees beyond basic tasks, you have to give them autonomy, mastery, and purpose the desire to do something that has meaning and is important. 
John Durr, the famous venture capitalist from Kleiner Perkins said, we need missionaries, not mercenaries. But vision also creates alignment. In this chart, uh, classic two by two, of course, for all the consultants in the room by Henrik Nieberg, who is the agile consultant behind the famous Spotify model, he mapped out kind of alignment versus autonomy. And if you start off in the bottom left corner with low autonomy and low alignment, you have a micromanaging organization and an indifferent culture. We've probably all felt those in the past. If you move up the alignment scale, you get an authoritative culture and a conformist uh, organization where the leader's there to tell you what to do, but also how to do it. If you instead move up the autonomy scale, you get an entrepreneurial organization with a chaotic culture where probably a lot of startups are today, right? You kind of hope somebody's working on the problem. And like any good two by two, you know you want to be in the top right corner. So high alignment and high autonomy is where you get an innovative organization, a collaborative culture where leadership is there to set that vision and set that direction. But it's up to the team to figure out how to achieve it. So you've probably seen something like this, right? The standard cookie cutter vision statement to be the leading slash best provider slash supplier of customer focused slash market driven solutions slash products, you know, delete as you will. And, and magically you have your own vision statement, but sadly these simply don't work. There is no fill in the blank vision statement. A good vision really asks, answers the question, what are you going to do for your customer? It's customer centric, it's concise and it's clear, it sets an audacious goal and it avoids any detail of how you're going to get there because that comes later. Bad visions on the other hand are company centric. They don't tackle challenges and they set you up for really bad strategy. Some of my favorite examples, just to give you some color here are Ikea, which is whose vision is to create a better everyday life for many people. You can imagine that this has nothing to do with furniture. It opens them up to innovating new ways or about anything about how housing. They have speakers now, they have lighting, they have all sorts of other tools that meet this vision. Nike's is to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. And the asterisk is their own. If you have a body, you are an athlete. So they're being inclusive about it as well. Tesla's is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. You'll notice cars don't actually mention in here at all. It's just their way of starting that journey towards sustainable energy. And it's allowed them to look into things like the battery packs, solar roofing, other tools that are coming out with Tesla. Kickstarters was to help bring creative projects to life. And one of my absolute favorites is Oxfam's, a world without poverty. Talk about your audacious goal. Who wouldn't get excited about going to work to work for that goal? You might not get there in your lifetime, but it's damned worth trying. So now that you set your vision, I actually jump to the bottom of the stack and make people think about their principles because these are a reflection of your vision and they kind of underpin everything else that you do because vision alone is not enough. And again, I love quoting famous people because it really drives home that message that it's not just me talking about these things. When you listen to someone like Disney saying, it's not hard to make decisions when you know what your values are. Um, and one of the best examples, again, from my personal history, as you heard, I worked at Monster for a long time. And we had in the very early days there, one of the founders came out and said, job seekers come first, because if we build a great experience with job seekers, recruiters will have to come to our platform. And that drove so many decisions for us where if we ever had that tension point as anyone who's ever worked at a marketplace will know, you always find tension of like, we can do this in a way that is beneficial for one side of the market or another side of the market. But at Monster, we said very clearly in a principle, job seekers always come first. So we always erred towards that. And we knew that if we built a great experience for them, the recruiters would have to follow them. But other companies do this as well. Google has focus on the user and all else will follow. Shopify has put merchants first, again, marketplace, but they're very clearly on the side of the merchant and building the best possible product to make their merchants successful because they know that will drive e-commerce success for everyone else. Klarna has very specific ones, so conversion trumps profitability optimization, again, really helping drive day-to-day -day decisions in their product organization. 
So whether you call them product principles, design principles, or values, they provide a framework for all the decision making that you do at every level of the organization. They should help with all those tiny decisions you and your team have to make every day. They're specific actionable rules and they're a manifestation of your vision. And a great way to do that is something called an even overstatement. Get specific about the trade-offs. So for example, conversion, even over revenue, user growth, even over revenue, mobile experience, even over desktop. They have to be relevant to you and your business. Again, there's no cookie cutter approach here, but using the even overstatement can help you highlight those contrasts. And you might recognize even overstatements from the Agile Manifesto. Anyone who's been in software development over the last 10 or 20 years has seen statements like this, right? Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. It doesn't mean the processes and tools aren't important. It's just that individuals and interactions are more important. So good principles make decisions easy. They describe how you want to build your product or your company. They're specific to you and your company. They're easy to remember, and they probably evolve over time. It's going to be hard to come up with them from day one. But if you have recurring decisions where you have these trade-off points, you need to come up with a good principle that helps you avoid that ongoing conversation. Bad principles, on the other hand, are meaningless fluff. You've probably heard a lot of these things like making delightful products. What does that even mean? How do we know if it's delightful? How does that help us make decisions? Is anyone actually proposing to make not delightful products? So bad principles don't differentiate you and differentiate you from others in your market. But fundamentally, principles are one of the best tools and one of the most often missing tools for increasing that decision velocity and decreasing conflict and dependencies among your teams. So if you go up the stack, we have our vision in place, we've underpinned it with our principles. The next step is really strategy. What are you going to achieve, going to do to achieve your vision? Strategy acknowledges problems and challenges and lays out a plan for how to overcome them in order to achieve your vision. And product and strategy is about how you attain that vision. It could be your value proposition, could include key feature areas, can also include business goals. And they're incredibly important because and in every presentation you want to Quote something like the art of war. Sun Tzu said, tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. And we can call it many things. Over the years, there have been many, 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 that's a long animation, many uh, different methodologies for doing this. But one of my favorites came out quite a while ago uh, in 1969. It's called the SWOT analysis. Anyone who's done you know, business 101 at high school or college has seen this. It's not sexy, but it's incredibly valuable to go through. And really, it highlights your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. There's other tools you can use to do similar things. Fundamentally, for me, it comes down to having a really frank conversation with your team about what your current situation is, the outcome and that vision that you're aiming for, the opportunities you have with your company to lever that you can leverage, and the possible actions that you might take to get there. Now, what I mean by that is your situation is, you know, who are your customers today? What does the market look like? What is the context? Who are you competing with? If you are building a new tool, what are they using to solve that problem today? All of these things build up a better picture of what your situation is. And the challenges then are competition and changing behavior, new trends that are coming in. Opportunities might be, again, markets changing, new technologies coming in. You have new things that you can leverage and do. Uh, new trends that are moving markets away. Anyone who was here, here in the early noughties building stuff, right? The smartphone trend was a huge new opportunity that some people took great advantage of, some people missed, and kind of their businesses died out along the way. And then finally, what actions can you take? And this is where if you're a student of Marty Kagan and, and others in the product space, you want to start thinking about those three um, key risks, right? What is valuable? to your, you and your biz, your customer, what's usable and what's feasible to build. And I want to dig in on that value point just for a second, because I think it's one of those things where we talk about value and often that can sound like, oh, I just want something that's going to increase my margins or like make this more valuable to me as a business. But really it's about understanding what is valuable to your customers. Even if you're a B2C app, what's valuable enough for them to want to spend their time or give you their money um, to, to be on your product? If you're a B2B, what 
is it that's valuable to them? Is it saving costs? Is it saving time? Is it driving new revenue? If you don't understand those levers, you're never going to be able to build innovative and successful businesses that solve that for them. So as an example, uh, as you heard, one of my most recent roles was as the interim CPO at Kazoo, um, which was, uh, is a used car marketplace online. And they really set out with a clear situation that the UK used car market, and this is just two years ago, is a, a huge multi-billion pound market, but it's highly, highly fragmented uh, and it's kind of famous for its poor user experience, right? Anybody who's bought a second-hand car from one of those like corner lot dealers know how, knows how terrible that experience can be. But yet, the biggest single player in the UK market had just a 2% market share. So there was huge opportunity to build something better. And the opportunities were that that market was still barely penetrated by e-commerce. Um, and it would take significant capital to succeed in, right? Because you have to buy the cars, you have to have a huge inventory. That's not a cheap business to run. And the threats were looking at U.S. companies. So there were a few U.S. startups that had been doing something similar there and, and getting a lot of success. One had gotten to an IPO. Um, they were looking to expand outside the U.S. Offline businesses. So there are one or two supermarket style businesses here in the U.K. that you know might want to move online and, and invest in e-commerce. And so the strategy really was to build the best possible experience, again, kind of putting that customer first in everything they did, to raise enough money to build a big business fast. And that's, it's fascinating, right, that that's kind of a business strategy that has, doesn't really talk that much about the product, doesn't really talk much about the cars, but really they realized that with the founding team that they had, one of the opportunities they had was simply to go raise more money faster than anyone else could in order to buy all those cars and basically build that market. And so Kazoo was launched two years ago. I was the fifth person in the door. And just this summer, they already IPO'd through a SPAC uh, at $8 billion valuation, I think, in the US. And so it just shows that like having a really clear strategy from day one and being able to execute towards that strategy is so incredibly powerful. So good strategy is based on your current reality. It really takes on those challenges. It doesn't shy away from the fact that there's hard things out there that we need to solve in order to achieve this. It outlines the value to your customer. It includes coherent actions and it emphasizes focus over compromise. Bad strategy on the other hand is again, full of meaningless fluff. Uh, the pretends there are no challenges will be smooth sailing. We're just gonna build this and it'll be great. Uh, mistakes, goals, or strategies, and sets you up for bad objectives. Too many strategies are simply budgets combined with market share projections, and it's not going to help you or your business execute towards it. Another way to think about this, and, and one of my favorite ways to visualize this, is actually to draw kind of a spider chart. Uh, if you map out various axes, and this might be different depending on your business, right? You can think about your different segments, your geographies, the opportunities, key, you know, new business or channels, value chain percent. Again, this will be very customized to you and your business. You can start thinking about mapping out where you are. And you can think about product market fit for where you are. Because product market fit isn't a one and done thing. It's, a, it's an ongoing, growing thing that you need to do for every new market, for every new segment that you want to tackle. And that also helps you map out, like, what are the one-step or two-step adjacencies? What is going to be the next easy adjacency here? If we're going into a new segment, what's the easiest and closest segment that we just have to do some incremental build for and not reinvent the wheel for? So strategy is fundamentally an art and a science. And it's just like a scientific hypothesis. It's an inductive leap that you have to subject to the same logical and empirical tests before you can validate it. And that means it's really hard. The only way to know if you've picked the right strategy is to validate it with customers and validate it out in the market. So once we set our strategy, it really comes down to the nitty gritty of starting to figure out, okay, well, what are we actually going to do? And this is where objectives and OKRs kind of come into things. For me, it's so important here that as founders, as product leaders, you declare the intent, but you give autonomy. So socialize that vision and strategy with your organization and with your team but let them work out how they can help achieve it in their areas, in their products. As George Patton, the famous World War II general said, if you tell people where to go, but not how to get there, you'll be amazed at the results. 
In the old model, command and control, you might set your company goals. You'd then go tell each team what their goals are based on that. You tell each individual what their goals are based on that. And you might set out your quarterly or annual goals. And at the end of the quarter of the year, you realize you missed all your goals because it was top-down driven and you had no actual insight driving this. A commitment model instead still starts with that vision and strategy from the company level. Uh, it sets out your goals, but then it kind of takes a step back and it lets each of the teams or product areas or business units or markets or geographies or however your organization is set up. Think about what are their objectives and how can they help contribute to the company goals? How can they, what can they commit to? What do they know they can solve? They have conversion issues or they have new markets they want to go into. What can they commit back to achieve in that quarter of that year? And before you've even started, you can see that there's a gap or not. And it really helps you identify that maybe you need to help team B here, be more ambitious. Maybe you need to spin up a new business unit. Maybe you need to rethink that strategy or your goals. But fundamentally, you know this before the period has even started. And that's where objectives and key results can be so valuable if you do them well. So objectives are all about being qualitative and inspirational. They're time bound and they're actionable. Key results, on the other hand, quantify the objective. They're really there to answer how, you, how to know if you've succeeded or not. And try to limit it to two or three metrics at the most, because otherwise you're going to end up in analysis paralysis. Fundamentally, it comes down to asking whether your business is focused on delivering customer value and business results, or what we call outcomes, or on shipping features and hitting metrics, which we can call outputs. And outcomes are so important because features, stories, bugs, lines of code are completely worthless if they don't actually achieve an outcome. Outcomes, on the other hand, are meaningful to the business and measurable by the team. They also have an impact. What impact might your outcomes have? How do they change your customers' lives or work? Yes, they're having an outcome on your business, they're moving your metrics forward, but you're also helping your customer have an outcome or have an impact on their work. As Peter Drucker, one of the most prolific business authors of the last century said, there's nothing quite so useless as doing with great efficiency something that should not be done at all. And I think as a tech industry, we've been very guilty of this over the last 10, 20 years, where we've developed all sorts of methodologies that help us build stuff really, really fast, but been very bad at figuring out whether that's the right thing to build in the first place. And this is where I like to bring in a tool called opportunities. So it's the next step down in the stack. Um, it's really about thinking how you're going to translate those objectives to action. How are you going to achieve that objective? And what opportunities do you have to do that? Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but the brilliant Teresa Torres developed this opportunity solution tree to help us do just this. It converts your objectives into actions, and it helps you break down those opportunities into solutions and finally into assumptions. And the beauty is that we can go test those assumptions much more easily than we can test fully built solutions. And as we work through the opportunity solution tree, we can quickly assess which opportunities are the best and make sure that we're testing them as quickly as possible by focusing on testing the assumptions that go into them. Now, again, I really implore you to go Google this. It's a fantastic tool. It takes a few times to get used to using. I use it with almost every startup that we work with today. And it really helps you focus out on what are the opportunities and get your whole team involved in figuring out how to do it. So really, this is how everything stacks together. You, everything connects from top to bottom. You're looking at everything from your vision, your strategy objectives to the opportunity, but then to the solution and then to the assumption test. And you can see how everything ladders all the way back up again. And really it helps you figure out where to start and tackling the most, the riskiest assumption that underpins your highest impact opportunity, which is why some people talk about riskiest assumption tests instead of minimum viable products because minimum viable products, can very easily be misconstrued as going and building something that's fully featured, fully fleshed out, when really you just need to figure out how can I test this riskiest assumption? And that might just be a conversation with four or five customers. It might be a paper prototype. There are many, many ways to test assumptions that involve no build whatsoever and get you to that answer much, much more quickly. As Tom Chi, who is the lead designer at Google X back in the day and designed Google Glass and their self-driving cars and a bunch of other things, said, maximize the rate of learning by minimizing the time to try things. 
Uh, he has an amazing talk on Mind the Product, if you want to go look it up, where he talks about how the first prototypes for Google Glass took literally hours because all they were doing was bending paper hangers and putting weights for the different components in different places to get a better sense of like, should the battery be at the back of the glasses or at the front of the glasses? What does that feel like? And literally, it just took them the thought time to put those together and test it without having to go through build, or no 3D printers involved, no fabbing, no manufacturers, no factories, just literally tools that they could pick up with their hands to figure these questions out before they took the next step and refined it more and more. So what does this all look like in practice? Well, I want to try paint a picture where this starts to connect the dots. And I'm going to use Google as an example just because everyone kind of knows how it works. Uh, obviously, Google has a parent company called Alphabet where their corporate vision is to make the world around you universally accessible and useful. That then boils down to individual companies where Google's is to make the world's information universally accessible and useful. Nest's is to create a home that takes care of the people inside it and the world around it. And YouTube's is to give everyone a voice and show them the world. As you can see, all these visions in interconnect, they all ladder up to that corporate vision, but they're all specific and unique to each individual company. And so if we dig into Google, again, at the vision level, organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible and useful. At the strategy level, it's to leverage that unrivaled store of data to better understand the content and serve the user with fast, accurate results. And some of their objectives over time, obviously, this is this all changes uh, every quarter. So these are now very old examples, but improving the call rate to capture more data, improving ranking algorithm to better understand the content, improving the speed of search result computation. All of these are the kind of objectives that naturally ladder out from that strategy. And then they have very clear principles as well. To be fast, obviously, they drive speed at every turn, page speed, search speed, loading speed, everything else. To be accurate, obviously, as a search engine, but also to be secret, right? It's a big black box, and they don't want people to know too well how it works, because otherwise people can game it and get their pages up the results. So once you have your decision stack, it's really down to how you implement it with your team. So with the team, it's important to think about opening up that leadership, because strategy is all about leadership. And leaders are so important, founding team, the C-suite, as your organization grows, your VPs and directors, because they have the overview and the insight and the experience to make those intuitive leaps to good strategy. But ultimately, everybody in your organization owns the outcome. So you can't do this completely behind closed doors. As Marty Kagan, who's probably the godfather of modern product management said, if you're only using your engineers to code, you're only getting half their value. And I'd say that's true for all of us. If you're only using your designers to push pixels around, you're only getting half their value. If you're only using your sales teams to make calls, you're only getting half their value. We all have unique insights and experience that we can bring to bear and help figure out better solutions to these problems. As Steve Jobs said, it doesn't make sense to hire smart people and then tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. And that creates this kind of natural balance between leadership and the team, where when you're talking about vision, that's almost all about leadership, but still involving the team. And as you get closer and closer and closer to the detail, leadership gets more, less and less involved. The team takes over more and more ownership. And ultimately, when you're into the detail of what are you going to build, how are you going to build it, what is it going to look like, it's all about the team. And leadership has to get out of the way. And that makes communication incredibly important. As John Maida said, clarity is the combination of transparency and understanding. Too often we focus too much on being transparent without making sure that everyone really understands what we mean with that vision statement. And being part of creating it is the ultimate way to drive that understanding. You also can't over communicate your vision and strategy enough every all hands, every status update, you should start with it so that people really, really do memorize it and think about it constantly. Print it on the walls when you're back in your offices um, is one of my favorite tools. And since I'm speaking to some Germans, at least, uh, at point nine, I want to bring up one of my favorite examples, which is from the company Zing in Hamburg, the kind of LinkedIn for the German language market, if, uh, if you're not familiar with them, who developed this internal concept called Auftragsklärung. 
And really that just means mission clarity. Uh, it's a tool that they use, this giant A1, A0 sheet that you see behind these people where they kind of set up their own canvas and you can use the business model canvas. You can create your own. It doesn't really matter what you're using. The beauty of this tool is that they developed it internally as a team and they use it consistently as a way to communicate what each team is working on, what they've learned along the way. They can add post-it notes to it. They can print out screenshots and put it up. They can add data to it, whatever they need. And then at least pre-pandemic, they would take these off the wall from their team. They would bring them into status updates with all hands, which walk it through. But that way, everyone has a consistent format for how they talk about these things. Anyone walking past this team in the office could it, at a glance see what they're working on and why. Uh, and it just introduces that clarity of uh, communication that's so critical for this to work. But it also brings up the question of cadence, right? And as the Agile Manifesto said, we value responding to change over following a plan. Too many strategies and OKRs can end up being very focused on a fixed roadmap or a fixed kind of strategy and don't give you the opportunity to change along the way. And that's because these things change at different rates, right? Your vision should be more or less static. It's almost a generational or maybe not even achievable in our generation kind of goal. Your strategy is probably the next three to five years. Your objectives are probably this year uh, or a quarter at the at the lowest end. Your opportunities obviously are in constant flux because you're coming up with new ideas as you learn new things, as you have new conversations, get new data. And then your principles kind of slow down that evolution again and make sure that you're constantly reflecting that vision and strategy. As Jeff Bezos said, be stubborn on the vision, but flexible on the details of how to get there. What that means in practice is so many organizations probably have like annual goals, right? So they set up their 2019 plan and then they see their results, at, you know, a, a quarter or two after the end of the year and whoops, we missed it or not. OKRs has at least kind of introduced a quarterly cadence. So we kind of look at that on a quarterly basis, but I'd suggest that you look even more often. At, if you're running sprints, do, look at this every two weeks. If you're running any other process, maybe a six week cadence, so at least splits your quarters in half, lets you check in along the way and build a cadence for learning. Because ultimately, if we're not learning, we're not going to know whether we're moving in the right direction, achieving our strategy or not. So make those check ins happen. Are we making progress towards our goals? What have we learned that might change our strategy or change our objectives and goals? What decisions do we keep making and fighting over that might make good principles or uh, for the team? So just to start wrapping up here, your job uh, as a product leader or a founder is to repeat that vision and mission often. Make sure it's super clear and everyone knows what it is. Ensure that this full stack that we've talked about today is in place and communicated often. And even more importantly, tell the stories of how you got here and why what you're doing and what you're building matters to customers, because that's what's going to inspire your team. If you're on the product team or in product people, Use the, your skills to help tell those stories and communicate that vision, mission, and principles with everyone else in the organization. Design better ways of working that put the customer at the center and feed your customer research and insights into the stack. And fundamentally, keep asking that question why so we make sure that the ladder is constantly aligned, both from the top to the bottom, but also from the bottom to the top. As Jim Barksdale, one of the co-founders of Netscape said, if we have evidence, let's look at evidence, but if all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. So as product people, it's so important that we keep asking questions and we keep feeding that into the process. How are we going to achieve our objectives? Why are we building this thing? Why are we making these decisions? And again, as product people, it's our user research and insights that can really feed into the stack at every level and make us sure that we have a great vision, a great strategy, great principles, and can really ask, answer those questions of why, what, and how. And fundamentally, again, to go back to the top, that helps us decrease that decision overload and conflict and increases decision velocity and quality. Make sure that we can keep moving fast and we can make the best possible decisions and make sure we're building the right things. And with that, thank you so much. Uh, I've included some further reading here, but you can also find out more at thedecisionstack.com. Uh, I am continuing to develop this, so do feel free to give me any feedback you might have. Uh, 